Almost 11 a.m. in Singapore and Shanghai. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets Asia. I'm Haslinda Amin. Here are the top stories. Asian stocks climb, led by Japanese shares, with the BOJ now widely expected to end its negative interest rate policy on Tuesday. China's factory output and investment grew more strongly than expected at the start of the year, showing stimulus measures are helping. But consumers are still not stepping up. Also ahead, India to hold the world's biggest elections over six weeks from April 19th. Prime Minister Modi bidding for a third term helped by a strong economy and also markets. And we're joined this hour by Morgan Stanley's chief Asia economist, Chetan Aya with his take on the region's biggest economies. And we have breaking news. Some Adani dollar bonds have dropped the most in over six months, and that's on the back of that probe by U.S. prosecutors expanding uh, the probe, not just on the group itself, but also on the man on potential bribery. Of course, uh, uh, the group has just recovered from that uh, Hindenburg uh, saga, now facing yet another problem. U.S. prosecutors expanding that Adani probe to review that potential bribery and we're seeing some Adani dollar bonds dropping the most in about six weeks, uh, rather six uh, months. Let's take a look at how it all pans out when India opens in 45 minutes from here. So a big week for markets with the Fed and BOJ in focus. Let's see how it's all playing out in today's trading with Avril Hong here in the Lion City. Avril, a consequential week yet when you take a look at the markets, not showing much nerves. Yeah, it might be a lot of it is already priced in or that they're just in wait and see mode. If you think about how the BOJ and the Fed's decisions this week are going to set the near-term direction for global markets. For the Fed, of course, it's about whether the data recently is going to cause it to dial back its intention on rate cuts for the year for the BOJ. We're seeing how Swartz market are fully pricing in a move tomorrow. And we already had those strong wage results from last Friday spurring that speculation. More recently, local media reports saying that we're going to see the rates taken to 0 to 0.1% for the BOJ. But if you think about it, it's not just that rate lift off that matters for traders. It's also about the forward guidance. And given how big the yield gap still is between the U.S. and Japan. We're seeing relative weakness still on the yen. That's helping some of the export-related counters in Japan. The Nikkei went into the lunch break with gains of upwards of 2%. And not just Japan or the U.S. that we're watching this week, of course, in the past hour or so, we got the data from China. And it shows a relatively mixed bag, but some stabilization. Retail sales disappointed slightly, while industrial production numbers showed uh, better than expected pickup. So all that seems to be pointing to some stabilization in the Chinese economy. We saw the offshore yen move towards the 7 2020 level. Well, not enough, it seems. Take a look at uh, the CSI 300 up only a tenth of 1%. Not just the Fed and BOJ decisions this week, yeah, it is a big week for central banks all over the world. Massive week. If you think about how the central banks of half of the world's economy are going to be coming out with their decisions, including the Swiss, the Norwegian, uh, the UK central banks, and it's also six of the 10 most traded currencies in the world, those central banks are going to be coming out with decisions. But it's not just what we're seeing in the developed markets, EMs as well, Latin America, Turkey. And this could also show us how the inflation risk view by central bankers seems to be diverging after that shock from the post-pandemic recovery and in light of the uh, conflict in Ukraine. So all in, this is going to be a very consequential week to watch for central bank decisions. Different policy dynamics no longer synchronized. Everil Hong, thank you so much for that. And we're focusing on that BOJ decision coming Tuesday. Here are some of our Bloomberg TV guests today on what to expect. Central banks uh, in Asia have generally uh, been holding tight this year, early this year. Uh, I think they're waiting to see the Fed move first before uh, easing further. And what they're going to do is to uh, raise the policy uh, rate and uh, they are going to end the negative interest rate policy. And I think that they are going probably going to uh, raise that 
to uh, 0 to 0 0.1 percent. Also, they are going to end the sort of new purchase of the, the ETF and the JREIT. But the Bank of Japan, uh, you know, clearly is on the path to uh, normalizing, and whether it's this meeting or next, you know, it, it, it's, it's almost it, almost going to happen. Having said that, um, you know, if they move, we'd expect them to move, but also at the same time talk expectations down so they don't want to have a runaway uh, policy uh, expectations of higher and higher rates. They'd want to push back against that. Also weighing in Goldman Sachs, it now expects the BOJ to hike rates on Tuesday. That's on the back of stronger wage outcomes and a number of news articles suggesting that a move is on. Well, for more, let's bring in our chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Angle in Tokyo. And MLive strategist Mark Cranfield here in the Lion City. Steve, let's start with you. Will they, won't they hike rates tomorrow? Yeah, it looks like they will. I mean, even if economists, and there are a number of economists, including one of the guests that we just heard from who sat with me today, uh, the former uh, deputy governor of the BOJ, who feels they shouldn't go, but admits they are going to go. It's pretty much baked in now. Uh, essentially, whoever leaked it, leaked it to the Nikkei, uh, GG Press, Kyoto, everyone here in Japan. So it's likely going to happen tomorrow. You can almost bet on it. Uh, but is that the right decision? And will there be, as we just heard from those guests, uh, clips from them. Essentially, will there be any telegraphing going forward of future rate hikes? Probably not. Uh, we're probably going to get uh, you know very accommodative speak from Governor Ueda tomorrow. Uh, essentially, look, the central bank. Uh, through the 90s and, and the, then led up to, of course, this continual deflation in Japan before the turnaround, essentially was filled with policy mistakes, many people say, uh, you know, prematurely withdrawing stimulus and then getting that political blowback. So they're going to be pretty dovish and pretty cautious while at the same time quite momentously, uh, you know, uh, stepping away from negative interest rate policy that's lasted for 17 years. And that Goldman Sachs report you mentioned, it simply highlights what uh, I just said. You know, they basically have made the call now. They are predicting a hike tomorrow. And they cited, again, those media reports that pretty much confirmed that. So it is about the messaging, Steve. What else are we looking out for tomorrow? Yeah, again, we're going to get uh, more statements of, uh, from Governor uh, Ueda at 3.30 local time. Uh, he's very unlikely, I mean, everyone I've talked to, uh, to give any kind of roadmap for future uh, rate hikes. He's going to talk about the fact that this is still an accommodative policy, and that could possibly mean that uh, the continual pace of bond purchases of JGBs will continue. They might, however, scrap the ETF and JREIT policy. Policy. Essentially, the, the ETF purchases have been in place since 2010 to put a backstop to the stock market. But, we, uh, but as we all know, of course, stocks have done extremely well with, with uh, the Nikkei at the beginning of trade today at 38,700 and change. Uh, and more recently, it was over 40,000 uh, on March 7th. So again, maybe they can dial back on those ETF and JREIT purchases. That's something most people do expect. Let's take a look at how markets are reacting. And Mark, you know what? Not much. It's been pretty calm, pretty unsettling. I mean, this is a first move since 2007, yet very little in terms of market reaction. Well, I wouldn't say not much in terms of market. We, we had the reaction last week, really. So if you think about what's been going on for the past couple of weeks, traders have been bombarded with media reports. The Bank of Japan is getting close. The wages are going up. BOJ's ready now. And now we've had leaks, as Stephen was saying, it suggests it's pretty much a done deal. And here we are, dollar yen's around the 149 area. Now, you would expect if, if traders were concerned, if they thought the Bank of Japan was going to be truly hawkish, dollar yen, you would think would be a lot lower than that. That what it tells you is that traders are much more concerned about the Fed to give them a shock rather than the, the Bank of Japan. At the same time as all this has been going on, U.S. Treasuries in the 10-year sector had its worst week of the year last week because the Fed is going to do the dot plots this week. And now traders think the data has been good enough and that the Fed will lower the dot plot expectations to only two rate cuts this year, not three. So really what that sets up is a situation where the Fed is going to be the swing factor. Probably the only chance for dollar yen to have a serious move lower is if the Federal Reserve surprises and keeps three dot plot rate cuts in the picture rather than two. The rest of it is priced in. 
So where to for the yen? In our M Live survey, most people expect the yen to end about 120 to 140. Is that even realistic? That really de relies on the, on the Federal Reserve doing their part in terms of, of rate cuts. And if they do change to only two cuts this year, dollar yen probably won't reach the lower end of that threshold. In fact, that whole M Life Pulse survey, some of the other interesting data from it, is the, the big takeaway is the fact that Japan has invested a lot of money overseas, especially in U.S. markets. A lot of money is held in U.S. treasuries. And yet people in the survey don't think much of that is going to come back to Japan. So what it's telling you is that the attraction of Japanese bonds is not going to be sufficient enough. Equities maybe they will probably continue to do well, but not as well as S&P 500 and U.S. markets. And so that big chunk of money the majority of it is going to stay overseas. That means that the yen is not going to get the big boost for money coming back. Japanese bonds are not going to get a big boost. So all in all, the impact on local Japanese markets is really not going to be that exciting. Exactly. Why ditch 5%? The question right now is JGB yields. I mean, those 10-year yields, when will get to 2%? <laughs> well, <laughs> That's then, a big question, Mark. It is. It is. And um, at first, I was, you know, just if you'd asked me a month ago, I would have said, yes, it, it's even possible for this year. We're at 0.77 at the moment. And then, but if you look back, for yields fell, they started falling in 2006 from 2%. It took them a decade to reach zero. We've been creeping back the other way. And now the Bank of Japan, as Stephen was saying, their outlook is going to be very dovish. They're going to promise to support the bond market, even though they may remove yield curve control to say, in theory, there's no headline rate for 10 year yields. But every time the market moves a bit, they'll be there to stabilize it, which suggests it's going to take a very long time to reach 2%. In our survey, nobody really expects rates to go above 1.5%. So it's certainly it's unlikely to happen this year, might not even happen next year. To be fair, the BOJ has been clear in its messaging. It has said before, don't expect consecutive rate hikes from the BOJ. Our Chief North Asia Correspondent Stephen Angle and M Live strategist Mark Cranfield, thank you so much for your insights today. Now, still ahead this hour, more analysis on the BOJ's upcoming decision with Morgan Stanley's Chief Asia Economist Chetan Ayer. We'll also discuss why he thinks India's current economic boom resembles its growth spurt in the mid-2000s. But first, Bank of Singapore on its outlook on China and why it says economic activity is stabilizing. Still to come, this is Bloomberg. Welcome back. China's economy saw a stronger than expected start to 2024 as the government targets an ambitious annual growth goal of around 5%. Factory output and fixed asset investments through February beat expectations. Retail sales also grew 5.5%, which is roughly in line with projections. However, Investments in property development fell 9% and remains a major drag on the economy. Our next guest thinks China's economic activity outside of the property sector appears stable. Let's bring in Eli Lee, Chief Investment Strategist at Bank of Singapore. Good to have you with us. Is that good enough? Well, I think, you know, it's, it's really, I think, uh, uh, for us, a sign of relief that the overall picture looks to be uh, one of stabilization, right? So outside of uh, the property sector, we saw industrial production beat retail a little weak, but really because of base effects as well. And importantly, versus what the market is pricing in, really depressed and bombed out valuations right now. I think the picture is better than anticipated. But when you take a look at the CSI 300 index, currently up by four tenths of one percent, pretty muted in terms of reaction. Why is that? And I'm just wondering whether it is good enough for you now to start dipping your toes in the China market. Right. I think there certainly will be, you know, good potential for a short-term rally, given where valuations are, given you know how skewed positioning is. But. Is this a sustainable recovery? I think this will have to depend on whether we see more policy stimulus and structural reforms from the policymakers. Outside property, you say things look stable. If you were to buy China, what would you be buying? Right. So we think that the internet sector really looks compelling right now, given where valuations are. And I think the infrastructure space looks inter interesting. And I think uh, re the renewable energy and EV complex uh, looks attractive as well. That's interesting because we saw a retreat in internet stocks recently because of the concerns of a TikTok uh, with Trump possibly uh, coming to power uh, if he wins uh, the elections at the year end. Might 
tech stocks, internet stocks in China be under a lot of pressure? We could see some near-term volatility, especially if Trump, uh, you know, the Trump president, the prospect of a Trump presidency comes back to the forefront. But let's not forget, uh, valuations have been pricing in a lot of negativity. Some of these tech stocks are down more than 50% from the peak. And the earnings season is coming up, Haslinda, and we think that from a bottom-up basis, some of these earnings could look pretty positive. For China and China stocks, what's key in terms of stimulus? How realistic is it to expect those deeper cuts in triple R, in L MLF, LPR? We think there are three fundamental areas that we need to see positive improvements on. So one, we need to see a bottoming out of the property market. Two, the issues in the local uh, government financing vehicles has to be resolved. And three, we think that uh, we need clearer signs that China is coming out of a deflationary trap. Now, the last inflation print that we saw for February coming out of deflation at 0.7 is a very positive sign in our view. Apart from China, Japan also in focus with the BOJ set to make its decision tomorrow. How are you positioning? Because uh, some, like Man Group, are making huge positions batting that the BOJ will make the moves that it expects? Well, I think conditions are right for the BOJ to make a move. For us, it could be tomorrow, but more likely in April. Now, the market is pricing in uh, the end of negative rates. I think that's academic by now. The timing is really, I think, uh, where the details will be. We think that the BOJ is unlikely to rush a move, right? I think they'll probably want to have the full data from the uh, Sunto wage rounds, maybe one more Takan survey, and I think one more uh, inflation print before making the move. There is no rush. I mean, they've been in negative risk for a long time, and this is a crucial exit. What do you do? Do you buy the yen? Do you buy the Nikkei? Do you buy JGBs or all of the above? All of the above. Well, we, we think the yen would appreciate. There could be some near-term volatility to Japanese equities. It's had a great run over the last one year. There could be some near-term volatility, but more links to the rally ahead. I mean, think. you talk about yen appreciating. It's not doing very much. In fact, it's strengthened now. It's at 149. Realistically, how much strength in the yen can we see when the dollar remains pretty uh, resilient with the Fed likely, perhaps, uh, you know, cutting the prospects of uh, rate cuts this year? We think the yen could strengthen as much as the 130 versus the dollar, which Why? is significant. Well, there are really, you know, two sides to this equation. I think on one hand, uh, the end of negative rates. On the other hand, we are still expecting for the Fed to cut rates starting in June, right? So I think that, you know, dual pressure on the rate differential could uh, cost the yen uh, to appreciate significantly. And let's not forget, the yen is the cheapest it's been in decades. But expectations are that we'll see repat repatriation of Japanese money from the US to, to Japan. But why would people ditch 5% for pretty much non-existent, 0, 0 0.1, perhaps even quarter of a percent? Right. That, that's a great question. Now, we think a lot of this uh, you know, uh, comes from what's being priced in right right now, right? So Japanese assets are looking interest increasingly interesting. Well, Japanese uh, equities are looking, you know, uh, more compelling as well. Still very uh, attractively priced from a fundamental levels in our view. So we think that the shift in capital flows will likely drive a cap an, an appreciation in yen ahead. What's the most compelling buy in Japan? In terms right. of companies, in terms of sectors. All right. We think the domestic consumption sector will really uh, benefit from this normalization in inflation and you know, a pickup in growth uh, prospects ahead. Japan versus the US versus China. Which market will outperform this year? That's a, that's a tough question. Now, we are still overweight Japanese equities versus the US. We think that valuations look more uh, attractive over there on a relative basis. China, we could see a trading rally over the near term, but whether that is sustainable really depends on whether we see more uh, policies uh, from uh, you know, the Chinese government. The market's behaving like there is very little risk out there. When you take a look at how the US, Japan, India are trading close to record highs, are you concerned about concentration risk? Should you be looking at rotation right now? For sure, right. I think within the U.S., a lot of concentration within the Magnificent Seven, right? You know, a very crowded trade. We think that the rally will likely broaden as it uh, matures. And, you know, after such, such a sharp global, uh, you know, equity uh, rally over the last four months, there's bound to be a little bit of volatility ahead. But if you step back and look at the bigger picture, inflation still in a broad downtrend, growth still fairly healthy, 
and rates about to come down, we think this is a classic reflationary environment. Equities will do well in our view. And how would you hedge against those risks? If you take a look at uh, gold ETFs, we saw an inflows into uh, gold ETFs just last week. Is that the best way to hedge against all the risks you're talking about? We think gold is a, is a very compelling hedge at this point in time. And as real uh, rates fall going forward, that's going to be another tailwind for gold as well. And year end, I'm just wondering, in terms of uh, bonds, stocks, as well as currencies, your most compelling calls would be? We like Japanese equities still. We are overweight in equities uh, overall. We like gold. We like the Japanese yen. And in fixed income, we like developed market investment grade bonds. And we like U.S. Treasuries. Anything well. you like in Europe? Uh, we, we think the healthcare sector in Europe is, is quite compelling right now. I think a, a few uh, really attractive opportunities there, uh, good valuations. All right, Eli, thank you so much for your time today. Eli Lee, Bank of Singapore. Plenty more ahead. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Chinese markets pretty muted despite better than expected data. Some stocks were tracking right now. Hong Kong developers in particular, in light of uh, developers seeing 24% drop in transactions over the weekend versus just a week ago. The homes were sold at a discount to attract buyers from the secondary market. The S&P says the supply glut and high borrowing costs, property prices in Hong Kong are set to continue to fall in 2024. We're seeing uh, red pretty much across the board. Henderson Land down almost 5%. Swire Property down almost 3%. We're also keeping a watch on uh, China brokerages. Uh, they're rising on China's vow for top uh, investment banks. That was issued on uh, Friday about setting up top investment banks and stepping up supervision of securities, brokerages, as well as public funds. Citic Securities uh, currently up by about 1.8%. CICC higher by almost 6% right now getting a lift for the Chinese stocks. We're also keeping an eye, by the way, on Chinese EV makers, uh, Xbank planning cheaper brands of models, and that's according to uh, Reuters. We're seeing Neo currently up by almost 5%, but Li Auto slumping about 4%. Prices will range from 100,000 yuan to 150,000 yuan for the new models. That comes to about 13,000 $895. BYD currently up by about 2.9%. And of course, Trump threatening 100% tariffs on Chinese cars made in Mexico. That's also playing out right there. Uh, CATL jumping on earnings beat analyst upgrades. And that's according to the market. CATL, there you have it. And overall, the market in uh, positive strategy, Japan, Nikkei 225, up by more than 1% as we await that decision from the BOJ. Take a look where we are in terms of uh, the, uh, the Japanese yen, pretty stable at 149. Plenty more ahead. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. There you have it, live in Shanghai. Welcome back. China markets just heading to launch CSI 300 index, extending its gains to almost half a percent. Perhaps temporary relief following this morning's data. Retail sales slightly missed expectations coming in at 5.5% versus uh, pro projections of 5.6%. But industrial production and fixed assets surprised to the upside. We have uh, China Shanghai Comp currently up by about half a percent. The yuan trading at 719.72 propped up by the fakes. And Japanese markets just coming back from lunch with a focus squarely on tomorrow's BOJ decision. Here's what our guests have been saying on what to expect. We've been saying that the Bank of Japan is very likely to be tightening policies. My view is that it will be a very dovish exit. Market split between a March and April exit from negative rates. Japan raises interest rate, the U.S. goes lower, the, the yen strengthens a little bit. I don't think that they want to risk any financial instability. The stock market has performed very well on the weaker yen, amongst yes. others. Um, so that could take a bit of the zest out of that. Yes, there will be hiccups, and it seems that these couple of months 
would be a little bit rough for Japanese equities, but at the same time, they can give you opportunities. The money is then leaves Japan. Where does it go? That's the interesting one. And that could bring us back maybe, maybe to China. Now let's take a closer look at how markets in Japan are faring with Avril Hong. And Avril, the Nikkei, an outperformer today. It's leading the charge in the equity space, the Nikkei climbing 2 plus percent. And we're back from the lunch break, hanging on to the gains from the morning session. And this is amid the slight weakness, relative weakness in the Japanese currency. But as you know, Haas, it's really all eyes on the BOJ tomorrow. Swartz market pricing in fully a move from the central bank. And we have local media reports showing that we could see it going to zero to 0 0.1 percent yet it's not just about the rate liftoff it is also about the forward guidance that we could get from the Japanese central bank now let's flip the board and take a look at what this means cross assets uh, because as you know that yield gap is still big between the US and Japan let's highlight first what we're seeing on the topics the Nikkei as I showed you earlier climbing two plus percent on the topics those gains are capped by a reversal today from the mining and the energy related counters. Remember last week they surged. They are among the biggest decliners on the broad-based gauge today. But as I say, the yen, that's still relative weakness as the yield has moved slightly a bit of a reversal from what we saw last week. So it's about that gap. Has going nowhere. Avril Hong, thank you so much for that. Now, Japan's chief executives are preparing their businesses for the first rate hike since 2007, with the Central Bank widely expected to end its negative rate cycle as soon as tomorrow. I spoke with Recruit CEO Hisayuki Idekoba to find out what a BOJ normalization could mean for business. I think, you know, the one big risk factor Japanese economy has is the really weak Japanese yen. So I think same as other central banks, it's just a matter of time how Japanese central bank is coming back to the normal situation. Has business sentiment improved, do you think? Is uh, finally seeing the kind of growth that yeah. they wanted to see? Yeah, I think, you know, what I'm hearing is finally Japanese companies can increase the prices of items and that's the first step to increase the uh, compensation and hourly wage and that cycle we we have to definitely uh, make it better and so to do that you know uh, first of all we need to increase the, uh, the price on the items especially in importing goods items because of the weaker weaker yen Everything is becoming more expensive, but uh, I think that's probably the first step to normalize Japanese inflation and economy. Recruit Holding CEO Hisayuki Edekoba, and you can watch my full interview with Recruit on the next episode of Latitude, which premieres March 28th. Now, staying with Japan, our next guest expects the BOJ will abolish its negative interest rate policy and yield curve control at Tuesday's meeting. Let's bring in Chetan Ayer, Chief Asia Economist at Morgan Stanley. Chetan, it does look like the stars finally aligned for the BOJ to normalize. That's right. And so I think you know our team has been uh, spot on on this for some time. We've been expecting that BOJ will be moving in March. And now with the uh, wage data in hand, it looks very likely that BOJ will be removing its uh, negative interest rates policy as well as YCC on, uh, on tomorrow. The thing is, Shadan, some say it is not time yet because demand is not strong enough. Fundamentals not quite in place. How do you respond to that? Well, I think the revision to uh, last quarter's GDP data as well to positive territory kind of allays that fear. Um, and I think the more important issue for us was uh, what is happening to the virtuous cycle of prices and wages. Um, now we've seen clear evidence that one round of price increases is translating into pretty significant wage growth. Um, and our uh, team has done some modeling work in trying to understand what is the ratio of wages 
passing through to prices. And our view is that that has moved up from a very negligible rate to now about 50 percent, uh, which then gives us an indication that core inflation in Japan is right now at a sustainable level of 1.5 to 1.75 percent, uh, which is uh, indicating to BOJ that they are on the track to get that 2 percent uh, inflation target. So we think there is a uh, clear signal from the wage growth data um, that they need to now sort of move out of this negative interest rate policy. Chetan, if the BOJ exits YCC tomorrow, normalizes policy, what would the next move be? Because the BOJ has been quite clear. Don't expect consecutive moves by the BOJ. That's right. Uh, I think they will uh, be uh, making it abundantly clear that this is not a beginning of a series of rate hikes. Um, we are expecting them to take up another move, but that's coming up in the meeting uh, in July, uh, and that would be another 15 bips hike to be taken up by the BOJ. And then we think BOJ is done. Um, and so I think they will have to try and give some guidance to that, uh, that aspect, um, that if at all, they will take up one or two more rate hikes and they will not be taking up a series of rate hikes and maintain the monetary policy in an accommodative territory until they have a, a very clear sight of 2% inflation uh, being achieved uh, on a sustainable basis. And we think that that will uh, be achieved in tomorrow's uh, policy meeting. What is sustainable for the yen, given what you have just said? It's at 149 right now. It was very hard for it to breach 147. Uh, give us a sense of where you expect uh, the currency to be. So we see our, our FX strategy team is forecasting a modest appreciation in yen. Uh, but understand that the rate differentials between U.S. and uh, Japan are still going to be very high. Uh, and so in our view, the, the, the direction of yen is now more likely to depend upon what's happening to the U.S. 10-year bond yields and the expectations on the Fed rate path. Uh, and we are expecting Fed to begin rate cuts from June. Um, so when that, that indication is more priced into the market in a firm manner, there will be some modest ap appreciation of yen that you will see. Uh, but it is not going to be appreciating in a way that that takes away this 2% uh, inflation target for BOJ. Chetan, I want to pivot to China. Pretty mixed picture in terms of data that came out today. Would you say that it is a reflection of a patchy recovery in the economy? Yeah, absolutely. And I think there were some one-off factors, like you had two extra days in the month of February. The Lunar New Year this time was a bit later uh, than last year. So we wouldn't take this uh, strength in the data as a clear indication of uh, China now uh, being out of the woods. Um, and we are still concerned about the deflationary trend. So to that extent, to, to wish that the pricing data that came out earlier was reflecting that PPI was uh, weaker than expected at minus 2.7. Uh, we are still expecting that China's GDP deflator uh, will be relatively weak, and that will constrain China's nominal GDP growth uh, in this year, as well as uh, from an outlook perspective, um, China's nominal GDP growth will be now structurally weaker in the range of 4 to 4.5%. Investors and economists have said time and time again that this is an economy that still requires more stimulus. Uh, PBOC has come out to say it will cut the triple R again. How meaningful would that be for the economy? I think it, it helps uh, in an environment where there are deflationary pressures. Um, keeping interest rates low will ensure that real rates don't go up too high. Uh, but at the, at the same time, you know, there's going to be only marginal reduction in interest rates in China. Uh, and from our perspective, uh, what they really need to do is to stimulate uh, economy with fiscal expansion. Uh, and that fiscal expansion should be targeted towards boosting consumption. Uh, but from whatever we are hearing from the policymakers, it seems that their focus is really to uh, push the supply side, focus on investment in manufacturing. Uh, and that's not likely to help them in addressing this deflation risk. Uh, Chetan, given what we have just discussed about the weakness of the economy, what is 
fair value for the yuan because uh, it's been propped up by the PBOC with the fixes. In fact, we saw uh, the strongest fix in quite a while just last week. So uh, it's hard to give you the, the the value of yuan versus the dollar because it's all like relative pricing. Uh, but from a fundamental perspective, uh, what we are arguing is to the extent to which they have these deflationary pressures uh, on a CEFPS basket or all on a basket basis, uh, yuan would uh, depreciate by about one to two percent. Uh, because, you know, in an environment where you have deflationary trend, um, there has to be that uh, benefit that has to come through from uh, some amount of depreciation in uh, currency. Uh, but they are unlikely to let the currency depreciate in a meaningful manner because uh, they would perceive that to be a sign of instability uh, and understand that while China is, um, you know, a reserve currency from SDR status perspective, from all practical purposes, it will still have the challenges which a typical emerging market currency would have if they let too much depreciation to come through, uh, there will be a self-fulfilling challenge in terms of capital outflows and therefore bigger currency depreciation risk. So uh, we think a modest uh, amount of depreciation is what uh, the, the central bank will be looking at. Chetan Hengtai Chetanaya from Morgan Stanley is sticking around. Let's do a check on uh, Adani stocks pre-market. Of course, the market starts trading in uh, about four minutes from here. All 10 Adani Group stocks sliding in pre-market uh, in Mumbai, and that's on the back of that investigation done uh, by the U.S. expanding its investigation. Of course, uh, this has to do with uh, whether or not it has engaged in bribery. We are also seeing uh, Adani dollar bonds falling the most in over six months on the back of that U.S. probe. Adani Ports notes due 2041 falling 2.4 cents, and that's the most since August. Plenty more ahead. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. India has announced that general elections will be held over six weeks from April 19th. The Election Commission says the seven-phase polls will be completed on June 1st, with vote counting on June 4th. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is bidding for a third term in office, boosted by a strong economy and a weakened opposition alliance that's been struggling to put across a cohesive message. Well, India starts trading in about 15 uh, seconds from here. Of course, this has been a gangbuster uh, uh, market with uh, foreign investors pumping in money time and time again. It has been seen as an alternative to the Chinese markets, and we've seen record highs after record highs. We're keeping a watch in particular on those uh, Adani group stocks. Uh, we saw them sliding in pre-market on the back uh, of uh, that investigation in the U.S., digging into whether or not an Adani entity or people linked to the company, including Adani himself, were involved in paying officials in India for favorable treatment on an energy project. We're seeing Adani stocks pretty much down across the board. Adani Enterprises down about 4.5%. Adani Energy Solutions uh, lower by almost 7% uh, right there. Dollar bonds, Adani dollar bonds dropping the most in over six months on the U.S. probe. Of course, this is a company that's just recovered from that Hindenburg crisis. Now, another challenge for it to overcome. Let's bring in Chetan Ayer, Chief Asia Economist and Morgan Stanley, who says India's current expansion resembles that of the mid-2000s when growth averaged more than 8%. Chetan, so 8% growth for India could be the norm from here. Well, no, I think we, we are basically saying that India will still grow at 65 to 7%. Uh, but what we are arguing is that in terms of the dynamic or the characteristics of this cycle will be similar to what we had seen in 2003 to 7, where it was driven by investment to GDP going up higher. Um, so, for example, in that cycle, what we'd seen is investment to GDP went up by about uh, over 10 percentage points to 38 percent by uh, 2007. And in this cycle, Cycle, we have seen something similar. It troughed at 28% of GDP, and we're expecting this to go to 36% over the next uh, three years. So that's the similarity that 
you know, makes us feel that this is similar to that uh, cycle. Um, but the key important point is that if growth is driven by investment, uh, then for an emerging market like India, you will not see the macro stability issues like high inflation or current account deficit. And therefore, it makes it easier for investors to sort of make an estimate of medium term growth, which would be sustainable without going through some uh, major challenges. The question is, Chetan, what is a sustainable pace of growth for India in the long term? The likes of uh, Raghuram Rajan uh, have come out to say that India needs to grow more than 8% to create more jobs, to lift more people out of poverty. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I wouldn't disagree with the fact that actually India does need higher growth rates. And we'd seen that China did achieve something like 10 percent for 30 years. So uh, to manage the concerns on uh, job market concerns, i.e. that, you know, if your uh, labor force is growing so strongly, then you need that kind of growth rate. Uh, but we do think that there are challenges for India to achieve, uh, you know, 8 to 10 percent growth rates. Um, the biggest issue would be um, uh, the infrastructure infrastructure set up. Uh, infrastructure is being built in India, uh, but it will have to do a lot more to get to 8 to 10 percent growth rate. And then the second challenge would be about uh, skilled manpower. Uh, so both these constraints we think will, um, uh, you know, makes us believe that India's growth is going to be strong, uh, but at 6.5 to 7 percent rather than uh, 8, 10 percent. People are beginning to talk about how India is an alternative to China. We're beginning to see that in the market already. In terms of the economy, I mean, what policies are needed to, to make India the choice destination for investors? Well, well, I think, you know, it, it will have its rightful place. Uh, and we are seeing that happening already in terms of the capital market inflows. Um, and even when you see the FDI data, India's market share in global FDI has been going up. Uh, in fact, it is uh, made the biggest delta in that market share um, after Japan within the region. And China has lost market share in uh, global FDI. So that trend is coming in through. Um, but to say that whether China, India can completely replace China or compete very heavily in the manufacturing sector, uh, we think that's uh, less likely uh, because, you know, China is far more advanced. And as, as you see from the data that China is getting into now new age industries like the renewable space as well as um, uh, legacy uh, chips. Uh, and India is uh, going to take time to get to that uh, type of uh, competitiveness. So we think India will see a gain in its market share for global goods exports and FDI, uh, but it would have to be still uh, in a, at its own merits rather than uh, taking right. away a market share in a big way from China. Chetan, very quickly, when do you expect the RBI to start cutting rates? So we're expecting RBI to cut in June, uh, but we are also conscious that the growth outcomes have been surprising on the upside. And if growth does continue to surprise on the upside, uh, there's a possibility that RBI may uh, de either delay the rate cuts or probably not take it up at all. Uh, but at this time, our base case is that they'll probably take up a shallow rate cut cycle in June. Chetan, great stuff. Chetan Aya, Chief Asia Economist and Morgan Stanley. Do come back soon. Plenty more ahead, especially on baseball's big bat on Asia. This is Bloomberg. The Los Angeles Dodgers and San, San Diego Padres are set to play in South Korea in the first games of the Major League Baseball season. With Shohei Otani and Ha Seung Kim on the field, 2024 is turning out to be the sports moment in Asia. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg Sohee Kim from Seoul. Sohee, so why MLB is holding this event in Seoul? Well, this is the first time that MLB is opening its season in South Korea, and it's also a big 
debut game for Shohei Otani with Dodgers. So all of baseball fans' eyes are on Seoul right now. Um, MLB's decision to hold the event in Seoul is truly an interesting choice. Korea has become a cultural gateway for Asia in recent years as its cultural influence has grown to the global level. So sports leagues want to use that K culture's influence for sure. So it comes at a time when the baseball league is trying to attract younger generations and push for growth outside the U.S. Thanks to Otani, MLB is seeing an exponential growth for its merchandise sales and views in Asia are also soaring. So all of this growth shows there is more room for Asia and MLB in Asia to boost their sales here um, with the merch and streaming rights and sponsorships. And it's a no-brainer for MLB to put efforts for Asia expansion. Exactly, no brainer. So apart from Seoul, where else in the region? Yeah, well, definitely China. Well, they are eyeing big on China and they are cultivating culture there and spread their brand there. Um, it's the biggest market, but still the number of baseball players are lagging behind other sports like um, soccer and basketball um, compared to their population. So one promising factor is that MLB has more appeal to young generation with its fashion brand in China. And South Korea's FNF is running MLB retail brand with licenses from the league and they have more than 1,000 MLB fashion stores in China. So if MLB manages to find at least one big Chinese player who would become a big like star like Otani, we will see massive growth there. So that's what MLB is hoping to see in China in the long, in the long run. All right. Asia is it. So he Kim, thank you so much for that. Of course, our colleague at Bloomberg News. Let's do a check on markets. Miners in particular on the back of iron ore slumping even more, slumping beyond that $100 level as uh, China concerns uh, spurring that uh, route. China steel currently down 6 tenths of 1%. We're seeing Fortescue metals in Australia down more than 1%. Iron ore itself trading in Singapore at 101.30, uh, up by about one uh, down in Dalian, currently down about half a percent. Of course, it is a big week uh, for markets. Fed and BOJ in focus this week for the Fed. A recalibration perhaps in markets. Bond traders no longer expecting that first cut. Take a look where we are in terms of uh, that uh, GMM, uh, Nikkei 225, extending the gains to about 2.2 percent. The BOJ may just be in the mood to move tomorrow. That is it. From Bloomberg Markets Asia, Daybreak Middle East and Africa is next. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg.